Diana, Princess of Wales, has died. This is according to British sources. The most photographed woman in the world has died trying not to have her photo taken. That doesn't make sense. Mourir comme n'importe quel kidam dans un, un tunnel, dans un banal accident de circulation. Non, on ne peut pas y croire. Bah si, si, c'est la vie, malheureusement. Hundreds of millions of people across the world use Facebook daily to interact. If you look at how we're growing, we're really just at the beginning. It's very difficult to defeat a conspiracy theory. Rubbish. Cover up. Definitely cover up. I think it's a little bit suspicious for an accident. Why would someone want to kill the Princess of Wales? This was one of the most important investigations that the UK had ever had. There's so many coincidences, so many odd things that just don't add up. Twelve members of the public will decide how Princess Diana and her lover died. Mr Alfired hopes they'll conclude it was murder. 85% of the ordinary people of this country believe Diana was murdered with my son. Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, Lord Stevens, is to publish the findings of his three-year investigation into the death of Princess Diana. We've done the report, we've come to conclusions, we had done a very, very thorough job. We knew in our own heart of hearts we'd done everything as best as we possibly could. I felt a lot of pressure towards the end because you think have I missed something here? Every single allegation, the 104, has been investigated. Every single one. Well, there is the report. You can't do any more than saying, this is what we did. Have a look, pick it apart. We knew every amateur sleuth in the world would be going through that, not to mention some serious legal people. It was not just a high-profile, dramatic case, but there are serious questions about members of the royal family. Maybe it was pure accident, but I found that difficult to believe. The basic question was, what's going on here? The primary purpose of this investigation has been to assess whether there is credible evidence to support an allegation of conspiracy to murder. If you know 85% of, of the population think that the most popular woman in the world has been murdered by the Queen's husband together with MI6, then the whole of the legal system and the way we do things is in jeopardy. It had to be dealt with. The inquiry has largely concentrated on a number of separate claims made by Mr. Mohammed Al-Fayed in documents and public appearances over the nine years since the crash. And she told me personally, if anything happened to me, be sure the finger is the person who have done it, is Prince Philip. She said that to you? Definitely, definitely. Why I'm so overwhelmed, you know? why I'm so convinced. 
At the heart of Mr. Al Fayed's allegation is his belief that the crash was murder because of the relationship between Mr. Dodi Al Fayed and the Princess of Wales. You also believe, Mohammed, strongly that Diana was pregnant at the time that she died, don't you? This was 100%. How can you be sure of that? Because she told me herself, and Dodi told me, I know this personally. Our responsibility was to show to Mr. Al Fayed, who'd made the allegation, this is what we've discovered. We weren't saying, Mohammed, we're, we're doubting you, but we have to be able to prove that all these things took place, because that's how the police operate. We are certain that the Princess of Wales was not pregnant at the time of her death. She was not engaged, and she was not about to get engaged. As you go through an investigation, you may look at more and more of the allegations and think, this is nonsense, this just isn't true. But you have to keep saying to yourself, keep an open mind. If there's evidence of a conspiracy, go and follow it. And that led to an issue for Lord Stevens in deciding what he did with the inquiry when it got towards Prince Philip. The allegations about Prince Philip were not specific. They didn't regard to any other evidence that we got in, in our possession. We contacted him and said, do you want to reply to any of what's been said? And he said he didn't have anything to add. There's not a single piece of evidence that Prince Philip was involved in a plot to kill the mother of his two grandchildren. We've looked and looked and looked and looked and looked. Mohammed, have you produced anything evidence-wise? Nothing, nothing, nothing. I have a lot of sympathy for Mohammed Al Fayed. He lost his son. What I have trouble with is that he made allegations without any evidence at all against people who loved the Princess of Wales. We have spoken to many of her family and closest friends. I mean, I went to the press conference. They clearly were working on the basis that everything that came out of Mohammed's mouth was not to be believed, and that, you know, he'd lost it, and he, he was just fantasizing. The establishment were very anxious to close Mohammed down. I had a good relationship with him from the very beginning. He always used to have a glass of champagne ready for me when I went in there, and I used to think it churlish not to have one glass with him. And this was a, a way of actually getting to know him better. Mohammed had wanted the commissioner to do this investigation, though he's, he's the one person who will be prepared to stand up to the establishment because he had done it before. I believe that any police officer has a duty to the public. The report was honest. We'd done it with integrity. And all of this relates to trust. The police will never get anywhere without the public trust. The most important thing about that report and the, the, the wait a minute moment, light shining through the darkness suddenly, was the Mishcon note. The note had been put in a safe at New Scotland Yard. I first saw it when I became commissioner. And the commissioner has a safe in his office where things are kept which are just for his eyes only. When you take over, as I did from Lord Condon, uh, he produced the Mishcon letter. Late October 1995, two years before the fatal crash, the Princess of Wales went to see her personal legal advisor, a man called Lord Mishcon, very well respected lawyer, and clearly the Princess trusted him. She went to see him to tell him about something that was on her mind, and he recorded exactly what was said. So he's writing here, I attended an HRH, obviously Princess Wales, at Kensington Palace yesterday, 30th October, at approximately 4 p.m. And what the princess said then was that she'd been informed by reliable sources 
whom she did not wish to reveal that a car accident might be staged in which she would either end up dead or be seriously injured and removed from the scene. So she wrote at least two notes. One was to her butler. And then there's this one. It seems to me what she wanted to do was to leave a marker down with somebody connected with the legal profession. After the crash, Lord Mishcon takes his note of that meeting to Lord Condon, who was the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police then, and says, bearing in mind what happened in Paris, I think you need to see this note of my meeting with the princess. The note is important because it's equivalent to somebody's premonition. If you were a police officer investigating it, you want to hand the account over to the French. They didn't do that. They stick it in the safe and they don't reveal it. Well, that was a decision made by Paul Condon. Paul Condon discussed it with Lord Mishcon and he said he didn't think there was anything in that. Because at that time, of course, it's just a crash. These, shall I call it, strange musings of Diana from two years ago, are they relevant to it? The assessment at that time was no. From 1997 onwards, when the Metropolitan Police were in possession of that note, it was always a judgment call about what you did with it. And the note was released to the coroner in December 2003, just before Paget started. They sat on it for years to protect part of the establishment, namely the royal family. What it demonstrates is serious reluctance to have this properly investigated from the beginning. Mohammed al-Fayed remains convinced that the Princess of Wales and his son Dodi died as a result of a conspiracy orchestrated by the British Secret Services. MI6 have spy on Dodi and Diana during their trip by bugging their phones, all the satellites, all the mobile, know where they are, find everywhere, every step. They've been murdered. There was a lot in the media about an alleged conversation between Paul Borough and the Queen. This morning, it was the Queen who was at the centre of the revelations. Mr Burrell says his meeting with her took place just a few days before he received an honour from her in November 1997. He says it took place in her private sitting room at the palace. When you think about this as a conspiracy theory, you must not forget people financially had something to gain by it being peddled. People like Paul Burrell were making a lot of money. I'm not saying he made it up. I just mean that the temptation, of course, would always be there to kind of just, just give us a little one-liner because then we'll give you lots of money and we'll serialize your book. I can only tell you the truth. I, I'm not going to embroider. I am not going to make anything up. I will tell you the truth. Exactly what I heard and what I saw. From uh, Mr. Burrell's uh, book, A Royal Duty, he writes, as the meeting neared its end, the Queen said one more thing to me. Looking over her half-rimmed spectacles, she said, do be careful, Paul. There are forces at work in my country of which even I have no knowledge. And she fixed me with a stare where her eyes made clear the, do you understand? We view that books, not Mr. Burroughs, any book like this, is written for commercial purposes. Police reports are written to get to the truth of what happened and rely on evidence. Basically, that is the truth of what happened. And she did look at me over a, a half rim spectacles and I remember her doing that and looking at me and saying, um, be aware that there are forces at work in my country. Since then, I've thought about that. And I think the Queen must be referring to the security forces. That's the only explanation I can have. It's an interesting viewpoint, Mr. Burrell. Um, 
but that's your version of what you think another person said and you don't know what to say to her head. I'm not going to go and ask the Queen, do you remember a conversation with Paul Burrell where you allegedly said this, that and the other? She said, well, what's that got to do with Operation Paget? Then what happened in Paris? I'd say, nothing, Mum. Why are you asking me? Because it was in Paul Burrell's book. It's like, no, we just deal with evidence. My son been murdered and I can't get to the truth. The campaign which MI6 are doing, how can I prove? That's important to bear in mind. Mr. al didn't suddenly start accusing MI6. Everything that related to allegations about MI6 stemmed from an ex-MI6 officer by the name of Richard Tomlinson. Richard Tomlinson worked for MI6. He was an MI6 officer. He actually was posted abroad. He's done all that stuff you might think of as being a spy. He worked from 1991 until 1995. In 1995, they released him, dismissed him. He was extremely upset about this. In 1998, Richard Tomlinson uh, saw a, I think it was a TV documentary about the crash. And he saw that in there, there was this talk about this bright white flashing strobe light that caused the crash. Now, Monsieur Levis, there will be two flashes yeah. behind you here. The distance, I think, will be just about the distance you say when there was a flash in the tunnel that night. Mm -hmm. So if you look out carefully here, no. that's the first one. Yeah. And now wait, we should see another one coming up. Yeah. Yeah. That the second, second one. one. Yeah. That the was second the second one. The second yeah, one. Yeah, sure. You're absolutely certain. Yeah, sure. Mr. Tomlinson says at this point in 1998, this is a year after uh, the crash, that it reminded him of something he'd seen while he was working in MI6, which was the plot to assassinate the Serbian leader. And that that plot involved a plan to kill them by staging a car accident in a tunnel with bright flashing strobe lights, disabling the chauffeur. Monsieur Leviste identified the much bigger flash, the second one, and that came from this piece of kit. Now this is an anti-personnel device, quite legal to buy in the UK, which sets off one enormously powerful flash of light. Shine this in somebody's eyes and they'll be stunned, disabled, blinded for several minutes. If you're driving a car when it happens, you'll almost certainly crash. I mean, I have seen a plan to kill President Milosevic of Serbia, so they do plan to kill people. Uh, to say that they were directly involved in the death of the Princess of Wales is a big step, but everyone has got a right to know what MI6 are capable of, what they, what they actually do. And clearly there are a lot of information, there's a lot of details in MI6 files which are relevant, and I think those should be handed over. So you've got an ex-MI6 officer who's inside the organisation saying these things, it has to be dealt with. in order for us to fully understand whether there was any credible evidence, meant that we had to go and speak with MI6. There was Lord Stevens, myself and David Douglas, drove to, uh, to Vauxhall Cross to ask them for access to their files and their records. We were in territory that no one had ever been in before, asking for those records to be opened up in a way that was unprecedented. We hoped that at the end of the day we would convince them it was in the public interest, the public interest, that they should open up their records so that we could do a proper job. If we'd have turned around and said, we've found no credible evidence, but we haven't been to MI6, we haven't managed to gain access to their files, we would have left a gaping door for those who wish to continue the conspiracy theories to, to do just that. We went to see the Director General of MI6 and we had a, a discussion about what we wanted to see and what we didn't want to see. And during that meeting, MI6 
said, we know the central plank of the allegation here is Richard Tomlinson saying there was this idea to assassinate someone in the Balkans. There was that awkward moment where they did reveal that, you know, there was some element of truth in the, in the suggestion. An officer, Witness A, as he's known as, put it forward briefly to a senior officer, and it was only an idea, so it didn't go any further than that. The thing is that Witness A showed Tomlinson. He said, look, this is my idea. What Witness A is crystal clear about is there's no reference here to a tunnel or a bright strobing light or all of this sort of stuff. There's just no reference to it at all. I interviewed Tomlinson, Jaron Padgett, and he said, yes, because of my anger, you know, at MI6, I may have mixed up my understanding of what I knew then and combined certain things. When bright strobing lights and everything else falls away, this becomes completely divorced from 1997. But you can't blame Mr. Alfayed for listening to that in the first place. At the core of what Tomlinson was saying was this scintilla of truth that there was a plan to assassinate somebody in the Balkans. I think it demonstrates there is a state within a state which is not accountable and trying to get hold of the truth is not straightforward. MI6's records are meticulous. Every single thing they do is actually documented and put on record. I wanted access to everything. Only three people in MI6 would have that type of access. It's called God's access. The lady who helped us was an MI6 officer, Miss X. She was given God's access. She could go anywhere in that system. Basically, we checked hundreds and hundreds of things. We wanted to find out if certain names appeared anywhere in their database. We did every search that we wanted to do for Operation Paget. You can take it from me, there was nothing in there that had relevance to what we were doing uh, in terms of evidence or taking our inquiries forward. What we're not telling you is some of the precise details that we're not allowed to tell you. I uh, looked at lots of files which really didn't have any link or relevance to the princess. And I found them extremely interesting, but that uh, goes with me and Dave Douglas to our graves. I'm in a privileged position. I know that we checked everything. Make your own mind up, but I know I'm telling the truth. Of all the conspiracy theories that have swirled around Diana and Dodie's death, the white Fiat Uno is one of the most persistent. Mohammed Al-Fayed claims that a white Fiat deliberately crashed into their Mercedes as part of a plot by the Duke of Edinburgh to kill the couple. We do believe that there was a glancing contact between the Mercedes driven by Henri Paul and a white Fiat Uno just before the Alma underpass. And much has been made of the French photojournalist Mr. James Andanson. It's been alleged that he was the driver of the Fiat Uno. Mr. Fayed thought James Anderson was the man. He was a spy for somebody. He was in Paris. He drove his battered up old Fiat Uno into the Mercedes. In 2000, he died in strange circumstances. James Anderson's body was found in a locked car which was completely burnt out. Uh, James Anderson was burnt beyond recognition. There was a hole in his head, which you could say, oh, that was a gunshot wound. Test du suicide ou du meurtre? There was all sorts of things in the newspapers saying, well, that's clearly the authorities murdering him, and therefore we had to look at him to definitively rule him in or rule him out. 
I got to see the photographs, I got to see the post-mortem reports and the criminal reports from the firemen and the police officers. There's no doubt that there was an accelerant used to cause the damage to the car and to him. His body was so badly damaged by the intensity of the fire. The damage to the skull is entirely explained by the ferocity and the length of the burning. There was nothing to suggest that these were gunshot wounds in any way, shape or form. There was nothing in my mind that moved it out of suicide into murder. We saw Mrs. Anderson, his widow. She said he couldn't have been in Paris when the crash happened. He flew down to Corsica that morning on an assignment to photograph Gilbert Becco, who apparently is a very famous French musician. There was a photograph that he'd taken of Gilbert Becco in his house. And behind Gilbert, the television is on, and you can see the TV cameras outside the Petit Salpetria hospital, clearly focusing on what happened to Diana. So the bottom line, James Anderson, he wasn't involved. It wasn't his car. He had nothing to do with it. It wasn't James Anderson. Diana and Dodie's Mercedes was involved in a glancing collision with a white Fiat Uno. But the driver of that car has never been traced, despite a massive investigation by French police. In the overall scheme of things, it probably didn't matter in identifying the driver. But the type of vehicle was important because the allegation being that the Fiat was used to deflect the Mercedes and cause the crash. Well, in, in my opinion, that's almost a laughable suggestion. The Mercedes is nearly two tonnes in weight. It was traveling at something approaching 70 miles an hour. It has a colossal amount of momentum. The Fiat is a little less than a ton, and it was traveling significantly slower. You can liken that to a, a, a huge New Zealand rugby player running down the high street and banging into a pensioner. Purely and simply from the speeds and masses of the vehicles, the Fiat cannot have been used to deliberately crash into the Mercedes to cause it to go on and have a further crash. Another question that had been left open was an allegation that there was a defect with the brakes on the Mercedes. Something had been done to the car to make it crash. She had mentioned that she thought that the brakes might be tampered with and um, that, that she might be the victim of an accident. I drove her car sometimes to reassure her, but she thought her life was in danger. The diner I first knew three or so years earlier was not like that. This was different, this was sinister. She now firmly believed that there were certain people who had an agenda against her. We examined the Mercedes in great detail, looking for defects or conditions that caused or contributed to the crash. We didn't find anything like that. It hadn't been tampered with at all. When you know the facts, it's quite simple. What we know happened from the forensic evidence, from the debris, the work that Tony Reid did on the reconstruction, the front right-hand side of the Mercedes just clipped the rear left-hand side of the Fiat Uno. He tried to correct the movement of the Mercedes, steered left, and sadly went directly in to the 13th pillar, doing around 64 miles per hour. The Mercedes hit the pillar more or less in the front, which meant that all the momentum was concentrated in one very, very small area. One massive impact where the occupants were subject to tremendous forces. Neither of the rear occupants were wearing a seatbelt, and I'm firmly convinced that if both of the occupants had been wearing seatbelts, they almost certainly would have survived. It was a survivable crash.
I'm confident on the evidence that we have now that a full and comprehensive picture of the events is there. Now what exactly happened is a matter for the inquest to decide. However, our conclusion is that there was no conspiracy to murder any occupants of that car. This was a tragic accident. We decided that um, we were going to give the report on the morning to the princes representing uh, Diana and to Muhammad Al Fayed representing Dodi. And Lord Stevens made himself available to go to Harrods to deliver it. Mr. Al Fayed at that point, that was it. He wasn't going to see Lord Stevens again. Do you still categorically believe that members of the royal family conspired to have your son and Diana murdered? I am certain. 100%. Mr. Alfred, when it was put to Lord Stevens this morning that you thought the inquiry is a cover up and a, and a whitewash, he dismissed you as a grieving parent. That you were crazy is maybe and do things like clouded. that. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, because he's himself mental case to, to no, say no, that, no, to no, just, no. To, sir, just, back, just to do that, back, to you. say that I'm a grief father, I'm going to talk nonsense. 90% of the ordinary people of this country support me. And with this support, I have the power. With God's blessing, I'm not going to rest until I expose the devastation those gangsters have inflicted on me. Do you have that Lord Stevens, whom you described when he was appointed as a man of total integrity, who is determined to discover the truth? What evidence do you have uh, that he's not behaving properly? Yeah. There is so many unanswered questions. Is this really an honest inquiry? Well, we'll he just he just done what British intelligence have asked. That he has betrayed me, betrayed the country. Unfortunately, I am being let down. I suppose when you put that type of effort in, you hope you've got a, a kind of a mutual trust between the two of you that he's going to give you a little bit of credibility for what you've done, and he didn't give any credibility to me at all. In fact, he accused me of being a criminal and a liar. If Lord Stevens was corrupt, if he was a tool of the state, then we were, by extension, the same thing. You're talking about officers from all aspects of the police service. You come along to do the best job they can, to suggest that we'd all got together and decided to conspire to make up this version of events is ridiculous. We did a really, really thorough job. And you take a sense of pride in that, that, that you've done a, a good job and that, yeah, at the end of it, we are all 100% sure there was no conspiracy. It was an honest, straight down the line investigation by a bunch of people, ordinary detectives brought in, who just thought, yeah, let's go on and do this. William and Harry have said today that they hope that Stephen's report will bring an end to the speculation surrounding their mother's death. What they can clearly never forget, though, is how the paparazzi behaved in the last moments of her life. Before the report came out, I had a one-to-one -one with both princes to take them through the inquiry and answer any of the questions that they wanted to ask. It was a difficult session for them and uh, probably quite difficult for me, really, because they wanted to know, they had very pertinent questions about what had happened to their mother. And it was the first time they'd heard in detail of what had taken place. Harry in particular, he was almost angry that this big distraction about conspiracy that she was murdered was given so much airtime and so much legitimacy. And I've had that discussion with him. I mean, imagine what it's like. Not only do you lose your mother when you're 12 years old in a car accident, but then the only thing anyone ever says about them for the next 10 years, 15 years of your life is whether or not they were murdered. William and Harry, we're all chewed up with sadness at the loss of a woman 
who wasn't even our mother. How great your suffering is, we cannot even imagine. Ultimately, you had two young boys grieving. They were probably more affected than anybody else. To have somebody suggest that their father and their grandfather had some responsibility for their mother's death. You know, no matter how small that kind of concern was and the fact that it was constantly being repeated in the press, to be able to give them confidence as to what happened and why it happened in itself was really important. All of the matters contained in the Stevens report need to be thoroughly tested. Lord Stevens said that such matters were best decided by an inquest, and we certainly concur that everything should be put before a jury of ordinary people in public in a coroner's court. Having an inquest was extremely important. I have a great belief in the jury system. I would much prefer an issue to be tried by a number of ordinary people than um, a professional judge who may have prejudiced views about particular issues. Michael Manson was doing his job highly proficiently. And when the jury's involved, there's a bit of theater around it. And you've got to be aware of that. And the theater is, you know, is he going to impress the jury that what we were saying was right? What's he going to try and influence the jury and come to conclusion that all those three years were not done in the thorough fashion they were done? And if he could put a kind of question mark over all of that, then, you know, he's done the job that he's been paid to do by his client. It was the day that Al Fayed's personal obsessions would get their public hearing. There were clues on the court steps that he was going to let rip. This is the moment for me to say exactly what I feel. And with God's help, I hope the truth will come out. He produces photographs of Duke of Edinburgh marching alongside certain undesirable Nazis before the war. I mean, you know, it's that sort of... Um, yeah, he did all that. But in a way, that was half expected because he'd been doing it. That's how he's always performed. Mr. Alfie had left the court looking delighted with his performance, but wasn't pleased to be questioned by journalists. But the evidence doesn't back you up, does it, Mr. Alfie? What evidence? The evidence from where? Is that you I'm not, not talking to you because you're a bloody idiot, you're part of the establishment, and you're a journalist. Belong. You work for MI6, you, work for MI6, you idiot. Do always in the back of my mind was that the jury had to come to their verdict based on the evidence that we presented and what was presented also by uh, Mr. Fayed's team and other people. The jury could have been highly critical and you know that's the chance you never you never know what's going to happen and you hope for the best but and you do your best, but you don't really know what's going to happen at the end of the day. So, yeah, I was nervous, all right. She died in the prime of her life at the height of her fame. A tragic death clouded by rumor and suspicion for the jury's decision. There was no conspiracy, no murder. The verdict is unlawful killing, grossly negligent driving of the following vehicles and of the Mercedes. The jury also pointed to Diana and Dodie's failure to wear seat belts and said the fact the car hit a pillar rather than the tunnel wall contributed to their deaths. I was relieved when they came out with the verdict they did. I really was. The team deserved that because they had worked their guts out to get to where we did. I just hope that this can bring closure to what has been a traumatic event for a lot of people. Mr. Al Fayed has said that he will accept the verdict of the jury. 
On hearing the verdict he least wanted, Mr. Al Fayed cancelled a planned press conference and swept away from court by car, leaving his spokeswoman to suggest that, in his mind at least, the conspiracy theories rage on. I am disappointed. The verdicts will come as a blow to the many millions of people around the world who've supported my struggle, and I thank them. I've always believed that Prince Philip and the Queen hold valuable evidence that only they know. They were not even questioned, but they should have been. No one should be above the law. At the end of it, there has to be a line in the sand. You have to reflect, and you've done everything that was, as human, was humanly possible. Now, difficult though it is, let it go because otherwise it'll eat you up. Mr. al you said during the inquest that you would accept its verdict. Do you do so now? I have decided, I think time for me now, I accept the verdict, but with a lot of really uh, things which I am not approving 100%. There's still a lot of options, but I'm tired, you know. So you don't want to go on any further? It's, it's difficult for me. For your own preservation, your own peace of mind, your own stability, you can say to yourself, I've done everything I can do for my son. And to, to give him his due, please let it go. I think that's enough. Mr. Alfayed, thank you so much. I'm sorry to have put you through this. Thank you. Yes, okay. thank, thank you so much. Th thank you, sir. Yes, of course. Il y a eu une enquête française qui démontre parfaitement les choses, une enquête anglaise qui suit, qui démontre parfaitement les choses. Qu'est-ce qu'il faut Une enquête de, de quoi de, de, Faite par le, le pape, l'église anglicane Par qui Par qui Nous avons fait notre enquête du mieux possible pour démontrer ce qui était démontrable. Maintenant, il ne faut pas se laisser bercer d'illusions et de personnes qui vont profiter de, de ce drame pour être euh, sur le devant de la scène pendant un instant éphémère. By all means, question everything that's in that Paget report. Question anything you want, but question it on the evidence and the facts. Don't question it on a headline that you saw last week or what your Aunt Mabel told you she'd heard the week before. Look at the facts. Bones. That is just a dreadful story. Oh, God. You write utter nonsense because you know it's going to sell. My job was to write something people wanted to read. My job was to you know, write a newspaper article that five million people would put their hands in the pocket and pay a pound for. Quite a lot of what I wrote was not true, but it was equally a little bit true. And that's why the papers absolutely love conspiracy theories, because they were... Um, <laughs> It's just make them up, basically. Whereas the truth was much less interesting. I never met a journalist who thought Princess Diana was murdered. But I know in a lot of newspapers that publish stories, including my own at times, that wouldn't have probably given that impression to the public. And you get in a situation where everyone can gain financially, and the one thing that just disappears out of the room is the truth. But my view of it never changed from start to finish. I wanted it to be a murder. It's a far better story 
I mean, she's dead, so it might as well be a good story how she died. It's not, it was an accident. It should never have happened, and it's an incredibly tragic one at that. And that's the end of the story. Prove that Prince of Tyler was killed by the royal family. Watch to the end, this one is crazy. August 31st, 1997, Princess Diana died in a car accident in Paris, France. A year prior to her death in 1996, she wrote a letter stating her husband is trying to kill her. 24 years after the event. Well, he wasn't even alive at the time of the crash. Facts that suggest that Princess Diana was murdered. There was 14 cameras in the surrounding area when Princess Diana crashed, and not one of them was working. Not true. It is said that Princess Diana was murdered due to the fact she was pregnant with a mixed race baby. Not true. Just look at the facts. The more I get into this, the more this is really looking like a cover up. There's something, I think, in the human psyche where you just can't believe that Princess of Wales died in such a I hate to say mundane, but a straightforward way, just in a car crash. That cannot be true. It can't be true. So they look for other explanations for it. There is no other explanation. The French military agency uh, locked up and prohibited access to the fire. The conspiracy theories will never go away. It's just going to go on, full stop. More fours uncovering the volatile relationship between Princess Diana and her remarkable stepmother. Princess Diana's wicked stepmother is next. Next year on Channel 4, why we as a nation were so vocal for and against the idea of saving animals when so many humans were at risk. Animal airlift escaping the Taliban. <laughs>